All right, I want you to turn to Acts, the 15th chapter tonight. The Acts of the Apostles. My old Sunday school teacher, where I grew up, called them the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. So. <laughs> Brother Sam Cliff, did you, did you know him? Todd, Sam. Anyway, Sam would call the Apostles the Apostles. And I guess probably it would suffice, would it, right? All right, let's stand for, in honor of the reading of God's Word, Acts 15. Uh, the Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ and the leaders of the church. Uh, they're meeting to discuss it, to discuss what it's about. Uh, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those. Uh, well, let's back up. I want to go back to verse 13 and start there, okay? And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God, at the first visit of the Gentiles, to take out of them a people for his name. Uh, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Father, we pray that you Bless the reading of your word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you will. Uh, in this passage, we're looking for the return of Christ. And there are certain things that are going to take place which will usher in the return of our Savior. And sometimes, I think in order to avoid any un being uncomfortable in our lives, we just assume that these things not take place. Because it will make us very uncomfortable when we see the new world order coming together, and when we see the heathen raging, as we read about in Psalm 2. But in Acts 15, chapters 13, verses 13 through 18, the Gentiles were starting to come to faith in God, and we see that a plan is presented. And the new world order, you've heard a lot about that. Uh, we have what I was teaching up until tonight on Sunday evenings was the uh, Christian worldview. In other words, there is a worldview that we as Christians are to embrace. And uh, we're looking for the return of Christ. That is the predominant thing that we as believers look forward to. And that's the return of the Savior because it's promised. And we can surely believe that he is coming again. Uh, God has a plan. And it's known unto God from the beginning of the world. First off, God has a plan for this world. You know, we can hear about the New World Order. We can uh, hear about uh, the New Age Movement. We can talk about all of these different philosophies that come in to destroy the Christian worldview. That's what they attempt to do is destroy the Christian worldview. And all these things come along, but God has a plan. He has a plan for this world. God has a plan for the church. In other words, uh, we're, we're not going to be left without God's plan being presented and coming forth at the appointed time. God has a plan for the Jews. Now, some folks don't think he has a plan for the Jews. He thinks that the Jews, some folks believe that the Jews have been cast away, cast out, and God is finished with them. Uh, yet they need to read the Bible. That's all I can say. Uh, you have to you have to really stretch to uh, present the, the New Testament church as the New Israel, because nowhere in Scripture are we called Israel. Nowhere in Scripture is the church replacing Israel and the promises that God made to Israel. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But God has a plan for the Jews. That plan is unfolding and will continue to unfold until the end of the age. 
Now, God has a plan for the Gentiles. He has a plan for you and me. He has a plan for the believer. So there's no panic in heaven. No matter what's taking place in this world, trust me, people are not, uh, or God is not wringing his hands. And, oh, gosh, I just wonder what's going to happen. I, I wonder what these crazy people are going to do next. Trust me, he knows exactly what's going to take place from beginning to end. Otherwise, he's just not God. It's that simple. But a worldview for the last days. You know, I keep saying, we're in trouble if a certain party doesn't get, a, get elected this next election. No, we're not. God's plan is this. So, I guess we're going to have to take comfort in that. If, uh, if uh, our man loses, and you know the ironic thing about it is both sides are saying the same thing. Did you know that? Yeah. That that shows you. you got you got fifty percent of people whose minds are blinded, whose eyes are blinded to truth, and you got the other half. Uh, but they would say the same thing. So it's kind of a flip flop. If the old orange man gets elected, we can't stand another four years. He's the devil himself. And you hear that from the other side, and then you hear from this side. Well. Well, I tell you, if Trump doesn't get elected, if Biden goes in, you can kiss this country goodbye. So, we hear it coming from both sides. And the view in that perspective is the view of, uh, of, uh, of the flesh, basically. In other words, we're taking God out of, the, out of the equation. We can't take God out of the equation. We can't say that God doesn't know what he's doing. We can't. Uh, alleviate the providence of God and say it doesn't exist, but yet talk about his sovereignty and providence over here. So, this new world order, uh, a world view for the last days, there's not a new world order. I'm going to present that to you tonight. You know, we talk about a new world order. Uh, it's the old world order that's been in the world and will be in the world until Jesus comes again. Man is depraved. Through the fall, man became totally in rebellion against God. He's totally a, a total sinner. He's totally depraved. There's nothing good about him. There's nothing righteous about him. There's nothing that he can do spiritually unless God intervenes because he's spiritually dead in his sins and his trespasses. That's why people can do such wicked things, and that's why... Professing believers can say it's all right to vote for someone that believes in abortion. Now, uh, my mind just won't let me do that. My, the Holy Spirit in me would not allow me to do that. But yet they say that they have the freedom to do that. And some of our Christian leaders have jumped on that bandwagon, which is very disappointing. Uh, one thing for sure, I'm losing more and more Christian heroes. I can tell you that right now. Uh, but there's not a new world order. It's an old world order. It's been around since the world began. There's more and more chaos and disorder. But behind it all is the almighty God. Do you think that God is not allowing these things to take place for his ultimate purpose? Uh, we need to understand this. Because if we don't understand it, we can get very discouraged. It's easy to get discouraged when we see what's taking place. Uh, looking, uh, you want to really get discouraged, just watch the news every night. Man, I tell you what, I, I don't know. I, I believe probably, you know, a third of the angels that fell from heaven were, became demons. It's what we know as demons. They're following their father Satan. I think a third of them is in the news media. Uh, I mean, honest to goodness, these people are continuously sowing discord, continuously. Pumping out negative things. Uh, nothing is bright. Everything is dark. And I'm going to tell you something. We, we talk about systemic race issues in this country. We talk about racial issues and how there is a race issue in America. If it was not for the news media, we would have no race issues as far as I'm concerned. Now, my black brothers may say otherwise, but that's their opinion. I, I didn't... I, I mean... <laughs> For one thing, how many white folks are brutally killed by the police each year and arrest when they reject the race? How many white folks are killed? You never hear a word about it. Yeah. But yet, you'll have a, an instance take place somewhere 
out in Minnesota or California uh, where a, a black man is, is killed. And it's front page news. And it's stirring and stirring and stirring and stirring. And you wonder where the racial issues come from in this country. It's the news media. They love it. They, I, I guess they think it's going to cause you to watch their programs more, to listen to them more. But anyway, nation is turning against nation. We see that. False cults are rising. False religion is rising. Uh, we have churches that call themselves churches of the living God that are preaching apostasy. If you come on Wednesday night or listen on Wednesday night, you know what apostasy is because I've been addressing it in depth through the little uh, letter that Jude wrote. But sin abounds. Should we be shocked? No, because the world is full of depraved sinners. So, there are four things that are out of place. And until these four things uh, get in place, this world will never come to order. First off, the church is out of place. The church is out of place. The church is the bride of Christ. The blood-bought bride of Christ is out of her rightful place at this moment. But y'all weren't aware of that, were you? But we're out of our place. The bride belongs to the groom. We belong to Jesus Christ. Now, spiritually, through the Holy Spirit, we are with Jesus, but we are not yet His bride. We, we've not, we've been betrothed, but we haven't, the marriage hasn't taken place yet. So the church is out of place. The all-consuming purpose of the Father is to present the church, what? As the bride, to present the bride to His Son, and that, that has to happen yet. That's, that's something that hasn't yet happened. Uh, we are not yet married to the Savior. We're betrothed to the Savior. Second Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin. So we have uh, been betrothed or espoused, but yet we have not yet come to the marriage which will take place with true believers, with this church. The Old Testament typology of the church being the bride of Christ is rooted in the imagery of the Oriental wedding. Now, I did a, a, a pretty in-depth study on the Oriental uh, marriage here a year or so back. I've done it a couple of times. It's so fascinating because the parallels of the church and Christ, and Christ as the bridegroom, the church as the bride, it, it's fascinating when you do that study. And it's a different culture. It's a different type of marriage than we think about here in America. Uh, but anyway, we're not yet married to the Savior. Uh, now, in the Oriental wedding, the groom would take the initiative. Now, didn't our Savior take the initiative? He took the first step. He first loved us. Now how can we think that he first loved us and then sing the song uh, or, or sing the song that, that he first loved us that we would never love him and he not first loved us but yet say that we have to express our love for him before he will accept us. Uh, that removes the whole picture of what grace is. Grace comes from God. Grace is the undeserved favor of, well, really for all of us. We, we are undeserving when it comes to the salvation yes. or when it comes to us becoming part of the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, as we're talking about tonight. But Jesus took the initiative. He first loved us. And in the Oriental wedding, the groom would pay a dowry. God knows that Jesus paid the price. He paid the penalty, and he purchased his bride. He purchased you, and he purchased me with his blood. Yes. Jesus paid the price for his bride. We've been purchased by the blood of the heavenly bridegroom. He, he shed his blood that we might have life. And after he purchased us, he gave us the token of his faithfulness. What was that? What's the token that we, we were given? The comfort, the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the token. The Holy Spirit is something that was given to his bride. Now, in modern days, an engagement ring is given as a token of love for the bride. Now, Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, in the Greek, the earnest of our inheritance is the same word as engagement ring. We need to understand that the Lord Jesus paid for us. He had to pay the price that was paid. He sought us, as the old song says, he bought us. Yeah. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And that is our groom. That is our bride. The church will be in her rightful place after the marriage takes place. And the bride is by the bridegroom's side. Over in Revelation, flip over to Revelation real quick, if you will, the 19th chapter. And let's look at verses 7 and 8. It says, let us be glad. Who's the us? That's, that's the bride. That's the, the elect of God. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of, these, of the saints. And then it goes on to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation. We, we read uh, about the marriage supper when, when we'll all rejoice together in the sweet by and by. But... In order for the bride to be ready, we have to go through some uh, beauty treatments. Some beauty treatments. Anybody ever uh, been involved in any kind of... Uh, man, I made a mistake one time, Cindy. Cindy, she, she kind of knows about this stuff. But, uh, I agreed to be a judge in a, beauty, a little girl beauty pageant down at church here. I swear, you had to write why you voted the way you voted. And uh, there was one little girl, she was red-headed, and her makeup was redder than her hair. And I made the grave mistake of writing on there. <laughs> well, her makeup wasn't really, didn't really blend with her hair color. Lord, I thought that mother was going to kill me. Man, these are Christian people. They were supposed to I tell you, I learned one thing. Never, ever again would I ever agree to judge a beauty contest. Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So I will never. Uh, my luck, that mother will be watching this live thing and I'll get her all stirred up again tonight. And that's been 30 years ago. <laughs> oh, Lord help me. But in order for the bride to be ready, we have to go through some beauty treatments. What beauty treatments does the bride have to go through? As the body of Christ. As the bride of Christ. First off, redemption. That deals with our inner beauty. We have to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only thing that will purchase totally dead sinners from this rebellious world that we live in and from the world and from the condition we're in through our depravity. And then the rapture. We're going to receive a transformed body according to the scriptures. And then our reward, our wedding gown is going to be the righteous act of the saints, we are told. We, the church, are out of place right now. We're waiting for our redeemer. We're a fugitive that's running away. And we see that uh, we are in a place and in a state. Uh, we're waiting. We're waiting to solidify the marriage in heaven. But right now we are betrothed as the bride of Christ. Now, the world is not our home. A vagabond has no home. A stranger is away from home. But a pilgrim is heading home. And we're pilgrims passing through, according to the scripture, looking forward to going home. We belong by the bridegroom's side. And soon and very soon we're going to be swept up to meet our Savior in the sky, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I believe in the rapture, don't you? Amen. I've heard so many people of late talking about, well, I just can't see. I, I believe the church is going to go through the tribulation. Well, if we do, we do, but I don't see it. 
I think we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come because that's what the Bible tells us. Now, Israel is out of place. Israel is out of place right now. Uh, I, I, I see all these Jews up in New York and elsewhere uh, voting for a party that's totally against their people over in Israel. Now, how do you figure that? I'm not one to talk, but that big nosed Barbara Streisand ought to be ashamed. She's a Jew and she hates the Jews. She hates the people. Schumer. Good gracious. What's wrong with these people? But they don't love their people. That's what it all comes down to. And most Jews, let me say this. Most Jews reject Christ as the Messiah. Most Jews are still, even the Orthodox Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. They're still waiting for him to come. It just uh, rattle, rattles your mind. And because of these things, Israel is out of place. Israel is out of place. The nation of Israel, the rightful owners of the land, belong in the land. That's one thing that old orange man did. He made Jerusalem the capital of Israel and said, this is yours. And this battle continues over there. You've got these uh, camel jockeys that came in there and claimed the land. The world wants to give them the land. and It was never their land. And yet, it, it's been, uh, we've, we've had years upon years of battle over who <coughs> Jerusalem and who Palestine and who, who Israel belongs to. Well, this just read your Bible. God tells you who it belongs to. There will never be a world order until Israel is restored to her land that there's peace in Jerusalem. Seems like we're far away from that, doesn't it? The Bible prophecies, that prophesies, I mean, that in the last days, Jerusalem will be the international hotspot. I haven't noticed that, have you? Have you noticed Israel's never in the news? Or how can that be the hotspot when you never hear Israel mentioned? That's all you hear. I mean, you can just follow Israel and you can know uh, where we are in, in, in church prophecy. But the Bible prophesies that in the last days, Jerusalem will be the international hotspot. God is not finished with Israel. And these folks that say God is finished with Israel are totally blind to many of the promises that have not been fulfilled yet. Uh, God will take out the church, I believe. Now, I believe this, uh, this is my opinion. He'll take the church out and then he's going to return and he's going to rebuild the temple. God gave the land of Israel to Abraham and to his descendants for an everlasting possession. We see that over in Genesis 17 8. I'd like for you, if you will, to turn over to uh, the prophet Ezekiel. While you're finding that, we see other promises that were made in Genesis 26, Genesis 28, Psalm 105, all these uh, scriptures in, in early Bible prophecy, which prophesies the uh, covenants and the promises that God made for the land ownership of Israel. But the Jews have been dispossessed, you might say. Much of their promised land has been taken away or was taken away at one point, And it was prophesied. I want us to look at Ezekiel 36. I'm going to begin reading with verse 17, and I'll read up to verse 27. So, beginning to read in verse 17 of the 36th chapter, this speaks of the renewing of Israel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying to Ezekiel, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed. The blood they had shed on the land. 
and for their idols with which they had defiled them. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I uh, judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not, I do this for, for your sake, O house of Israel, but for the holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hollow in you, uh, hollow in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into my own land. And when I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Are you following this? Are you seeing the restoration of Israel here that was prophesied by Ezekiel? I will give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36. So what's Ezekiel 36 saying? First off, he speaks of the defiled land. Because of their disobedience, they will be uh, dispersed. And they were. The prophecy came true. They were just dispersed. Throughout. That's how you've got Jews and all the nations the world. They were dispersed. And uh, then Ezekiel 36, 18 and 19, they shed innocent blood and God judged them. Now this is the same reason God's going to judge America, because of the innocent blood that we shed. You can't kill babies and not be judged. I think we're already in judgment. We just have to figure it out. But anyway, uh, we see that they were judged because of the shedding of innocent blood. And then in verse 20, they were the chosen people, but they were a disgrace to God. They profaned the name of God as they went out. And God has resolved that he is going to bring them back into the land. In Ezekiel 36, 21, 23, God said he will be glorified and the heathen will see when he is through with the Jew and with Israel. And then verse 24, this has already begun to happen before our own eyes. Uh, much prophecy could not be fulfilled until 1948. In 1948, when the Republic of Israel was constituting, the, one of the greatest miracles in the history of mankind took place. Uh, people don't just, I don't think people really realize what a miracle it took for Israel to be constituted as a republic once again, and as a people, once again, with their own land. I don't, I don't think anybody really realizes the miracle that took place there. But it had to happen. And I believe that that kicked into motion the end times. Now there's coming a day when Israel will look upon the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Even though they reject Him now, there will come a day when they'll look to Him as their Savior. They will be spiritually born again. Just like we are born again, it has to be a work of God through the grace of God, turning our hearts and revealing to us and illuminating to us who we are and, and causing us to repent for our sins and turn to Him, therefore being washed by His blood and therefore change taking place because we've been spiritually made alive through the Holy Spirit. This is going to take place with Israel. They will be spiritually born again. Ezekiel 36, 25, 27, do not let anyone say that God is through with Israel. God is not through with Israel. And 
And you know, many very popular preachers believe that. And uh, I personally, and I've taught you guys this before over in our uh, Bible studies, uh, you know, I, when I teach against replacement theology, I'm premillennial to the core, dispensational premillennial, actually. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are historic premillennial, uh, which isn't uh, nearly as far away as the replacement people. Who are the replacement people? The amillennialists, the postmillennialists, the fully reformed. I call them the fully deformed. But anyway, uh, the, these people who, who believe, and they'll, then they'll argue, argue little, silly little points like over in Daniel, uh, whether he is the Antichrist or he is the Savior and all this crazy stuff. But anyway, uh, disregarding all the rest of Scripture, and that's unfortunate. Why don't you turn real quick over to Romans, if you will. And, and let's look at Romans uh, 11. I got some slick pages in this Bible, and I'm sliding all over the place. Okay, in the, the 11th chapter of Romans, Look at what Paul writes. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness is, in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come. In other words, they're blind because the fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come. But God speaking to Gentiles says, don't be dumb. In other words, and then other places he scolds the Gentiles for even thinking that God is finished with Israel. God speaking to Gentiles says, don't be dumb, don't be boastful, don't be ignorant, don't be wise to your own conceit. Some Christians are Jews, the Messianic Jews. Unbelieving Jews are not lying when they say they do not see Jesus as there is coming a time when that the last Gentile will be saved and God will be finished with his plan for the Gentiles, the Gentile nations. Now, over in Romans, uh, we see that, uh, you know, you, you're absolutely ignorant if you think God is finished with Israel. Today's world order is destined to fall because of the problem of Jerusalem. The Arabs and Muslims claim Jerusalem as their own. The Jews claim Jerusalem as their own. We are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in the Psalms. God will bless those that bless the Jews and curse those that curse the Jews. How many of you believe that? Yes. I've heard people say, well, you, you, all, you folks take that out of context. I don't know how you can take that out of context. It, it, I mean, how, it's pretty simple. God will bless those that bless the Jews and curse those that curse the Jews. I mean, how simple can it be? But yet, we see tremendous anti-Semitism within the body of Christ. And that is allowed because of replacement theology. There would have been no Spanish Inquisition were it not for Roman Catholic eschatology. What do I mean by that? They taught that the Jews had been cast off, the Jews were Jesus killers, therefore we can do whatever we, we can destroy them any way we want to. We hate Jews. Therefore, we had the Inquisition. And then, a little in a little more modern times, Hitler. Hitler was a Presbyterian. Did you know that? <laughs> or at least that's what he said he was. Hitler was a Presbyterian, or a Lutheran, I'm sorry, a Lutheran. I get a little confused. You know. It's like that. It's like the guy going to the big Lutheran church there in the big city. I've told you all this once before, but I just got to tell you again because it fits right in. Didn't have a tie. The guy said, you can't come into our church without a tie, sir. And he said, well, I don't have one. He said, just this one time, you can find something to put around your neck. I'll allow you to go in. He goes to his car, he comes back, and he's got jumper cables tied around his neck. And the guy said, uh, well, since I promised you, I'm going to let you go in. And 
He texted you. He said, wait a minute, though. Don't you start it. <laughs> I love it. Most people, most people don't catch that. It takes them about 20 minutes to catch what I'm saying. Don't you start it. You know, jump the table. But anyway, <laughs> I love it. But anyway, God will bless those that bless the Jews and curse those that curse the Jews. And uh, Jeremiah 31, 3, we should love what God loves. Romans 10, 1, there is a remnant of Jews that will be saved. But before before the tribulation. And from a human standpoint, we are indebted to the Jews for the Savior and in turn for our salvation. The salvation came from the Jews. Christ's lineage through the Jews. John 4, 22, it is from the it is from and through the Jews that we receive the word of God and the Messiah. How wonderful that is. Ultimately, we receive these things from God, but it's, he used the Jews as the channel to bring it to us. So, not only is the church out of place, but the Jews are out of place, and Satan is out of place. I bet you're hoping I won't exhort that tonight, and I won't. We'll, we'll wait on that. But Satan is out of place, and Jesus is out of place. So, We'll, we'll look at that, finish up that next week, Lord willing. But it's kind of fascinating to see the situation of the world now and how it, it fits in to what I shared with you tonight, just like a glove. Uh, the new world order is the old world. It's been a battle from the beginning against God and against truth. And that battle today is still being fought. And it will continue to be fought until Jesus comes again. Let's stand, if you will. And Ron, if you would, would you close the prayer for us? Father, we're thankful again for another opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you for the word. We pray, Lord, that you just bless us, keep us safe as we go home. Give us opportunities this week that we might be able to be a light. Uh, in this world that we live in, and uh, Father, that we would uh, have an opportunity maybe to share Christ with others through our actions, through our words. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to guide the church and pastor and uh, uh, this acquisition that we're looking at tonight that we voted on. We pray, Lord, that you just bless it. We ask it all in Christ's name.